Well, it's 7 o'clock, so we'll get started. Uh, first, we'll start with a roll call. Boren? Here. Berg? Here. Serta present. Davis? Here. Groff? Here. Hannah? Here. Kittleson? Here. Clayunas? Here. Manny? Here. Meyer? Here. Montemayor? Here. Radke? Here. Ryan? Here. Susha? Here. Vanderweele? Here. Verhasselt? Here. 16 present. A quorum is present. I will call the Committee of the Whole meeting to order. With that, I'll ask for approval of minutes of the last meeting held June 12, 2006. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Just wait. Under discussion. Alderman Montemar. <laughs> Thank you, Alderman Vanderbilt. On the minutes last time, you know, all of us working together, watching what we're all doing, I think is a good idea because the minutes say that I was sitting up there last time. And I don't think I was. <laughs> but, you know, these innocent little mistakes, and they truly are innocent, but we have to watch all of our details and get all of our information straight all the time. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Montemero, for pointing that out. We will fix that. Mm -hmm. uh, moving on. First, I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight because this is now our second Committee of the Whole meeting this week and just the fact that we're all here and we have so many committee meetings I just I thank you for coming your commitment is is just unbelievable thank you and then we'll go with a discussion regarding possible locations for a new police facility with uh, including Vandervart North 23rd Street and City Hall Alderman Groff thank you mr. chairman um, a lot of you will notice that John Sabanash is here from Zimmerman and Associates. Um, the reason he's here is because Building Use did invite him uh, to discuss item number 11, which is the um, RC um, and resolution regarding the um, contract for the police facility and City Hall Ar Architectural Services, um, which was referred to this committee. And then also during our, our, during our Building Use Committee meeting, um, last week that we had. Um, it was uh, discussed that we needed John to come here and answer a few questions um, as they come up to discussing um, the various building sites. And then also one, one thing he was charged with doing for this meeting specifically was to um, tell us what he could build for $8.8 .8 million, which is the amount in, the, in that um, police facility and, and city hall architectural service agreement. And then uh, also the building use committee said 10 million and then 12 million. So those three figures. So I would ask that uh, privilege of the floor be granted to him to either give his presentation now or when, um, when questions are asked. And I would so move that if that's. Thank you, Alderman McGraw. Um, I don't believe we need to and correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe we need to vote on it in the committee of the whole oh. meeting. That um, I'll just ask Mr. Sabinash to give us his presentation and discuss those items. Okay, I'll try to get through this quickly, but please ask questions. I, I guess I'd rather have it be a little more interactive because we're dealing with so many variables. If you, you kind of wait, sometimes you lose how important that subject item is on the topic we're talking about. So on the information that I'm passing through, I decided to, because there's been a lot of discourse about sites and options and all kinds of things, I decided to go back to the August 22 um, site study to get back to a baseline framework of how big and, and what order of magnitude each of the individual sites had relative to one another. 
And so what you see on this sheet is, is actually the base framework of what I had, and I tried to highlight as best I could to try to extend ourselves out to the future and where we currently are relative to the project compared to where we were. And it's important to note that the uh, 2005 site assessment identified construction costs in 2006 dollars, so we need to project those costs into 2007. I think we've talked about that and uh, the volatility of that market, and you're all aware of that. Secondarily, as part of that consideration of the project, we had identified in the yellow area a building of approximately 65,000 square feet with unit costs for what I would refer to as the building at about $180 a square foot and fleet at about $102.50 a square foot. There were additional allowances for site construction and landscaping. And that generated at that time a, a projected cost of $10,907,500. That was in comparison, and, and the average square foot cost is $167.81 a square foot. In terms of order of magnitude, what we did at that time is we extended um, the construction costs that had been identified by other consultants at that time into like uh, quantities of, of building, if you will. And we were at that time tracking a building of about 80,000 square feet uh, that was similar to the recommendation that was generated by uh, uh, Engberg Anderson Moyer that had about an 80,500 square foot facility. And then the 2004 report generated by Kimmy with Steubenrock had identified a 68,000 square foot facility. So in terms of the order of magnitude, we said we're probably going to be on the order of magnitude of 65,000 square feet. That was a reduction of about 15,000 square feet from where we had previously identified the building program to be. There are some things that I, I think are important to note relative to the project. And that is that as we, because we're dealing with very general information and we extend our unit costs, there are some assumptions embedded within those discussions. But I, I think we can say that philosophically there are certain things that we know will have good repercussions on the budget and certain things that we know that will generate more challenges than the alternatives. Uh, and so the, the comment that I had in there is that philosophically we will generally be more affecting at reducing the cost of the project when we're talking about a slab on grade building. It's important to note that because generally speaking it's the most cost effective way of building buildings that we have. When we go to multiple stories there are stairs and elevators and things like that that tend to uh, increase the cost, and we're not at a magnitude or a size of project that has an efficiency that we, we tend to see a building envelope reduction. So it, it's important to note that. And then why would that be? And it's generally because when we get into the city hall building, we're probably gonna find that um, the comparisons that we would do elsewhere are not gonna be governed by what exists here. And I think there will be a strong desire to have the building start to relate to this building when we're talking about a building that's elsewhere, we'll generally have a lot more design latitude in terms of how the building looks that would generally reduce the cost rather than increase. And I tend to say that at the city hall site, we would probably find that there would be people saying, gee, why isn't there stone on the building like there is on the existing and things like that. So I think in general terms, anything that we can do that gets us a slab on grade construction generally is going to help. Uh, and then lastly, as we design the project, it's likely we will be more efficient in a single-story building and reduce the overall size of the building. There are a series of sheets that follow the discourse about construction size and order of magnitude of the project. And it's important to note that I just carried $10.9 million. The effort to facilitate the discussion about what you would have for other project definitions, 12 million, 10.8, 8.8 is still on this sheet, the second sheet that you have in your pack. And I kept the information that is grayed in, again, directly translated from what we had in the report, and then took a look at City Hall 23rd Street specifically relative to other project costs. It's important to note that other project costs are costs incurred relative to the design and uh, construction of the project. They're costs that likely would be incurred, and they tend to range somewhere between 30 and 50% of the construction budget, depending on what the site is and whether certain costs are rolled into that number. And so off of the needs analysis, I took a, a look at the City Hall on 23rd Street uh, order of magnitude. I said, well, given what we know now, are there certain things that given those two sites we would be able to reduce in the budget? And there were some reductions. But generally, we had viewed City Hall on 23rd Street at that time, and even with the reductions that we looked at, an order of magnitude of about $15 million. 
the challenge that was presented to us relative to the request of the uh, committee was, okay, we don't want to spend that much, so if I'm working backwards from a budget, as opposed to programming and then establishing a budget, if I set a hard, fast budget, how much building does that buy? And so it's important to note that on that, on that tabulation, there's a column in there next to City Hall that I called minimum. And it's not a given that uh, other project costs just relate directly to the cost of the project. If we really ground that down into smaller percentages, smaller pieces, things that we don't want to see incurred as part of the project or would come out of another budget or some other mechanism to control those costs. For the order of project that we're talking about at the smallest level, we would expect that that cost would be about $2.6 million. So we see that there's about a 1.2 well, to 2.8 or excuse me, $1.8 to $2 million difference between that high order of magnitude that might be seen at those other sites and then this hypothetical minimum that we would really work very hard to achieve. It's important to note because as we get down into the bottom, when we start working to establish the budget, I'm going to take those other project costs, I'm going to take them out at the outset. And so the $12 million budget target, I took we're not going to have a, min a minimum. We're going to have something in between. I said $3.9 million of the project. It results in a residual construction cost of about $8.1 million. And then the real question becomes, how much square foot does that buy me at $8.1 million? And philosophically, what I identified in the last column is the residual square footage would be about 42,000 square feet, 42,500 square feet. That will relate to the program discussion that we'll have um, in, a, in a little bit to try to reconcile how much building that buys. But it buys about 40,000 square foot of building at about $180 a square foot. Likewise, backing off $10.8 million and using a slightly less intensive project cost of 3.68, it results in a residual construction value of 7.1, little, little little hair over that. The net residual square footage is 37,600 square feet. And it's important to remember that in the, in the project from where we started at 80 to where we thought we were at 65, 42,000 is a substantial difference. At $8.8 .8 million total project, taking out the other project cost at that very minimum level, we would find ourselves with a resultant residual construction cost of about $6.1 million dollars and a likely square footage target of about 32,000 square feet. Uh, it's important to note that to achieve it, I really had to look at it that, at that very bottom, taking the fleet out. We don't have an order of magnitude of, of building that begins to warrant the fleet being included. So we took the cheapest piece out. That's not necessarily the best way to control cost. If you ended up blending those dollars back into a number that had some fleet in it and less building, you're going to end up getting more building because you're you're adding cheap space rather than and taking out expensive space rather than just taking out the more economical space. So as a as a, a comparison mechanism, uh, we'll go through the program in a moment. But 12 million resulted in about 42,000 square feet of space. 10.8 resulted in about 37 and a half thousand square feet, and 8.8 .8 resulted in about 32,000 square feet. As part of the packet of information that you have, there are all of the resultant other project costs that are enumerated. What we're trying to do is be as transparent as we possibly can so that we can adequately define the budget. We don't want surprises or things that weren't expected because given uh, the importance of the project, uh, the scrutiny, the implications on the budget, it's important to have all of those items identified. I'll go through quickly to identify where some of the major differences would lie. Other project costs, building and land acquisition. The city hall site we had identified in the report a placeholder of a million dollars that would likely be required to create parking somewhere else within the city to offset the parking that was going to be relegated to the basically the building footprint. The 23rd Street site we had identified about $700,000. That was roughly at the time, if I remember correctly, about $500,000 of land value plus about the $180,000 that likely would be imposed on the project. Um, and the Vandevart site, which I know is a point of contention, we had a $1.5 million, which at that time was 15 acres at $100,000 an acre. So as we control the budget, any of these variables change, we can change the budget accordingly and uh, control our own destiny as a decision-making body. 
Uh, professional fees, there are some things that are just embedded in here that are percentages of construction costs that if you reduce the cost, the cost goes down by a like percentage. So it's important to note that although we can't just unilaterally change all the variables, if you make a smaller building, you would expect to see some of these costs go down and professional fees would be part of that uh, equation. There is nothing currently in the program project budget for permits and fees. Um, in terms of utility costs, the costs are enumerated based on baseline costs as well as construction costs in a 12-month or an 18-month construction schedule. So when we expect to see a more complex building program that takes longer time to build, we're going to pay more to temporarily heat as well as illuminate that project site. Uh, telecommunications and technology has identified the probably two pieces that would be of interest relative to sites is that the 23rd Street site and City Hall had two different allowances in for fiber optics. We basically had to get fiber optics to a site at a $40,000 allowance at 23rd Street. If I took the minimum, which curiously increases the budget, I, I, if I'm going somewhere, I still have to have a fiber optic link. At City Hall, because our infrastructure existed, we didn't have to budget for that. Likewise, in terms of radio communications, we had an allowance in the project budget for radio tower at the 23rd Street site and then hypothetically another site. See those costs come down significantly when we're talking about the city hall site because we already have that pre-existing infrastructure. I made modifications to the uh, furniture, furnishings, and equipment budget that on the minimum side would require more rehabilitated and relocated uh, furniture and furnishings that would probably be likely when you're looking to try to make the project smaller from a budget sense. Um, on the other project costs for special equipment, assuming that if we got to the very small project that had, you know, down to 30,000 square feet, I'm assuming I'm not building a vehicle maintenance facility and as a result I have no costs incurred for vehicle lifts, so I changed that. On occupancy expenses, the city hall site, we had more money in for moves because we're probably going to move more than once when we're on this site. With an extended construction duration, the, the move would be more complex for the moving company. On the administrative side, you're going to see design and estimating contingencies that are flat percentages of construction. And then on the minimum, looking at where we'd be on construction, those are held at as, as a straight percentage, but they're significantly lower. So where we have about a million dollars in contingencies on both City Hall and 23rd Street, on that minimum, it's down to $600,000, uh, uh, recognizing that we have about a $6 million construction project, not a $10 million construction project. And then in addition to that, what's not taken out of this are the credits that we would see on sales tax as well as potential interest earned on the debt service during the uh, construction time frame. Does anybody have any questions on how that is generated? Hearing none. I know there was some consideration for what would a project that was significantly reduced begin to look like in terms of size of project. And, and although I, I have not had a chance to review the information with the department, I took a shot at saying what would I do if somebody came to me and said, you gotta, f gotta do something with this. What would, it, what would that fix be? And so as point of reference, Went in and cleaned up some things that I had in the program. Um, and in the column that I added next to the, what I had defined as the 23rd Street site from the last time, I tried to identify how much of the program is used by each of the individual bureaus that are housed within the facility. And so what we see is that for the public areas of the building, that's about 3% of the building. That for administrative functions, chief's office and other overall administrative functions, that's again about 3%. Information services, which is the records area, is about 4%. Uh, communication side's about 3 The training components, which include the locker facilities that uh, could be located virtually anywhere in these categories, but happens to be in training, is about 14%. The fleet operations is broken into two pieces. It's generally vehicle storage and other things where vehicles are parked and then other contributing pieces like bike and bulk storage, decontamination, medical storage that are usually associated with garage space. That directly assignable space is about 2% and the garage and, and other fleet storage and servicing components are about 37% of the program. Investigations and evidence management are about 6%. 
a portion of evidence management includes vehicle impound and vehicle evidence uh, capacity, so there's some vehicle in there, but it's about 6% of the total program. Uh, patrol is about 9%. Prisoner processing, booking components within the building are about 4 Miscellaneous and shared spaces are about 1 and then building maintenance, uh, mechanical spaces and the like are about 8%. Um, looking at that current program, it's about 70,000 square feet. We would we would find a mechanism to get it to the 65,000. I think that that was doable. Uh, but the other scenarios, I think, are potentially of interest. Okay, so somebody says to me, $12 million, 42,500 square feet, how do you do it? Um, I would tend to say that first and foremost, you have to get rid of the fleet. 42,000, you know, when you're at 65,000 and you need to get to 425, uh, you'd probably take a look at the biggest spaces first. And then I made modest reductions in other program components, again, indiscriminate of uh, how they might have impacted the building as a whole to try to get to where we needed to be. And you, what you see is it's doable, but um, there are some compromises. Generally speaking, though, if we're looking at... Yes. Mr. Sabinish? Yes. Um, Alderman Graf has a question. Please. Thank you. One of the questions that did come up in building use when we were looking at these columns on the other handouts that you'd given us is um, large spaces. Yes. What is your definition of, um, how do you define large spaces? So at least we have some idea of what that means when we see it on these. I'll, I'll, get, a, I'll get a sheet that has something that's large on it. Let's say it's, uh, let's actually use fleet. When we're referring to large spaces, we're referring to programmed areas, in this case vehicle storage, that generally have the net to gross more accurately defined within them. So they're generally big areas that we've programmed to accommodate things that don't require additional square footage contributory to them to be imposed on them. We're looking at small spaces. There are mathematical exercises that we go to to define how big the building is, and they're generally percentages that are applied to what's the net square footage or the usable area of the building to define how ultimately big it is. And it takes into account things like corridors, things like wall thicknesses, building envelope, things that make the building bigger just by their nature to fit the 120 square foot, 150 square foot spaces in a building as a whole. And so when we get the large spaces, generally when we do the program, they're as big as they would ultimately need to be and they therefore can stand alone and they don't get multiplied out with as vigorous or as aggressive a multiplying factor as we see elsewhere. And that generally is in areas where we have workstations and cubicles, areas where we have uh, vehicle parking and things of that nature that just don't require a bigger building than it would be otherwise. And so to get to the 43,000 square feet, I generally looked at it and said, well, if we try to keep most of the building in place, and that's defined in that first row. We see that the net building that's residual is largely intact, but clearly we've taken a substantial amount of space out of the vehicle storage that's in that column that says large spaces, but it's really the vehicle storage that takes the hit to try to get close to the 42.5. And as close as I could get without making any substantial modifications, I got to about 43,000 square feet. Uh, it's still too big. You'd still have to make some cuts, but you would say you're well within striking distance at that level to hit your target square footage. On the 10.8 million, I said, that's not enough. I got to get back to about 37,600 square feet. So I just did a random of t about 10% across the board cut. I said, geez, you just take it and you cut it. Whatever it is, you hold, the, you hold the, the bureau to about the size that it needs to be as a function of how big it is, and you just reduce. So if it's a 120-square-foot office, you cut it by 10%. Whatever you're left with is what you're left with. And that effort proved to be beneficial from a square footage targeting standpoint in that it got down to about 37,500 square feet, so it's very close, again, to the target square footage. The last scenario was the most radical in that we were going from basically 65,000 to about 32,000 square feet. And there I did, a, I did the 10% cut, and then I cut it again by anywhere between 10 and 15%, sometimes less. Uh, but it's important to note that in addition to that, where we start getting zeros for fleet, now we start getting zeros in for communications. I, I, I can't imagine not running with communications, but it's a, it's a point of identifying how drastic the need would be to cut square footage to hit your budget. 
looking at other changes within fleet operations, uh, evidence management, you know, prisoner processing. Again, I can't, I, I couldn't actually imagine to get to 8.8 .8 cutting that component, but that's the kind of drastic technique that would have to be imposed to get from 65,000 square feet to 32,000 square feet. And so, there, I mean, there's no, there's no happy solution if you're looking to get to a lower threshold. Building costs are what they are. They keep going up. Um, square footage is needed. I mean, we're in about 15,000 square feet here. That would be about a double in terms of size. So, I mean, it's significant, but it would be a drastic cut in program, especially in light of the comparison data at the outset that was about 68 to 80,000 square feet from independent consultants. So um, I hope that gives you a better grasp of how much work would have to happen to hit those targets. And some, I think, would probably be a little easier to take. Some would be very difficult. But that's the way we would approach it if you said hit a number. And at a certain point, I would tend to say you just you can't live with that kind of solution. I can't imagine, like I said, I can't imagine getting rid of prisoner processing and holding. Uh, you'd try to find something else, I would guess. Mr. Sabinesh? Yes. Um, I have Alderman Susha who has a question. Thank you. Um, first of all, have you taken into consideration that we've got the detention center on the south side of town, and currently when we have violent criminals, that's where they're processed because they need to be put in jail? So, you know, eliminating that space might be a possibility. I know that uh, not everybody would necessarily be going to jail that's coming to the police station, but violent criminals are already going there. So it's not that far-fetched. I appreciate the fact that you finally showed us what a building would look like for $8.8 .8 million, because that is what is in your contract, is the budget of $8.8 .8 million. So I'm glad to see that you're finally identifying what we could get. Um, in regards to the Communication Bureau, cutting that out, there has been talk over the years about combining uh, communications with the county, and this would be a wonderful opportunity to open up a discussion uh, to go that route. In regards to eliminating the fleet operations, that is something that was discussed uh, in the building use uh, committee last week. And, you know, when you look at the, the city's table of organization, we have a fleet division for transit. We have mechanics for transit. We have mechanics for the fire department. We've got mechanics for the police department, we've got mechanics for public works, we've got mechanics all over the place, and um, it sure would be nice if we could consolidate some of that work. You know, we've got all these different sets of tools and all these different garages throughout the city, so um, I appreciate the fact that you, you took that into consideration to eliminate that. Um, I, I have a question in regards to the $180 square foot amount. I did receive an email from um, a constituent who was, was questioning um, how we computed that. So if you could just refresh my memory and everybody watching at home, where did the $180 a square foot come from? Uh, it's based on project costs that we've seen in the bid environment as well as comparison cost data on other like projects. It places us at about the 50th percentile nationally, where there's half the project cost more per square foot, half cost less. Okay, thank you. Did, did you want me to answer any of the questions that you had? I'd like to maybe address the lockup. We're not building a jail here, okay? It's a secure transfer point for the processing of people who are in custody, including photographic and fingerprint um, recording and information gathering that is isolated from the majority of the rest of the building. So when we're talking about the detention of people in custody, we're not building a detention facility, but it is the place that in all police departments allows uh, people who are working within the building to photograph and fingerprint and question people without uh, going into the main body of the building. So it's not a jail, and if somebody was going to be held, they would be taken to uh, county holding facilities in accord with uh, normal law enforcement protocol. But in this case, it's a place to actually uh, retrieve information from people who are brought into the building that may be less than cooperative. Uh, we have another question, uh, President Berg. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Janesville uh, does not have maintenance, per se, as part of their program. They do, however, have an impound area, and their sally port is built and structured as part of the to total building wrap to allow for 
Uh, storage of the squad cars that are currently in fleet use uh, allows for some, uh, some of the forensic kind of uh, detail you need when you've got a car in impound and also allows for one or two square squad storages. Would you foresee that type of design as being part of uh, when you structure the sally port or uh, would you take out virtually any on-site storage for the vehicles that are in current use that are just maybe at the station for processing of a prisoner or what have you? Um, that's a design question that I, I don't have an answer for quite yet, but clearly to achieve a budget, um, we've looked at the fleet as one of the major governing factors and how big the building is. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sort of trip that trigger until I philosophically got to that about that $10.8 million level, and then I started to look at evidence management and prisoner processing that were vehicle related. So uh, one may look at that and say that that, and without consultation of the department, and it's a little presumptive to say that that's acceptable to them. Um, we were focusing philosophically, I was focusing on big chunks that um, kept those major sort of programmatic functions in place, specifically vehicle processing that was related to vehicle evidence. Um, knowing that impound is elsewhere, we still need to remove physical evidence from vehicles. And then secondarily, the sally port, which I view as a, as a separate and distinct item, even though it can be co-located within a fleet storage space. Alderman Serta, you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to point out here, and um, Mr. Sabanash, you weren't privy to this information, but looking at these numbers, um, Vandervart exceeds it, um, your cost estimates about $3 million, but that's taking into consideration that that was 15 acres, mm -hmm. and just for the public and the current the co Common Council that that has possibly been subject to change. Um, also under the, I have two questions, under the building and land acquisition costs for City Hall, do you foresee, foresee exceeding the... 0.6 acres that we currently have available, will we need additional space? Well, when we were looking at that from a comparison standpoint, we acknowledged that if we built uh, on the City Hall property that there might be some need, want, or other um, effort made to offset that parking by acquiring something elsewhere. If you, as an example, said, I don't care about that one, well, parking is what it is, whatever we have is what we have, then you would basically take the million dollars out of the budget and you would not offset that parking elsewhere. So, you know, even looking at this, if you changed Van de Vart to whatever it is, 400,000, 500,000, philosophically it allows you to get that comparison media in place and make those comparisons within each of the individual categories. Additionally, on page four, you're marked for Van der Vart. Seems to be at the most disadvantage with $30,000 for landscaping design. Um, could you just elaborate on what that was earmarked for? Well, Again, that could be subject to change. Yeah, we viewed that one as a fairly complex site in that it was a, it's a hilly terrain. There was probably a lot of pre-existing vegetation that would be difficult. And then the soil conditions, given that it was highly compacted, would probably be difficult for landscaping. And so we viewed that as a probable site premium relative to the other ones. Okay. And just, and just lastly, I just might add, Beyond, um, I would ask um, wherever you feel appropriate to um, just have the chief just explain how the efficient it would affect the efficiencies of your office if indeed we took out um, the vehicle storage and then um, how it would affect the efficiencies too if we didn't have prisoners processed in your department here. And maybe I guess maybe I didn't accurately identify. Do, you, do we want to go through the individual categories of ideas that the committee had? Well, I or is a that few, a bad idea? Or, or? I have a few people that want to okay. ask you some questions right now. Chief will hold up with that if, if that's okay. Alderman Racky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is it possible we can have the lights back on? It's very difficult to read the papers in front of us, and we can't see the overhead projector from here anyway. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Graf. Yeah. John, you had said that um, a slab on grade was the most economical. Yep. Okay. Based on um, we have two areas basically that we can have um, a slab on grade as of right now. Is there any area that is, in your opinion, um, uh, better suited for a slab on grade or is there some um, concerns that you might have if... Um, 
I'll just address the three sites because I think philosophically those are the three that are of the most interest. The 23rd Street site uh, would accommodate a slab on grade building. Even when we're looking at the size of building, the 80,000 square feet, it was a fairly tight site. We're, we're smaller than that now. I would tend to say that it would still accommodate a project of this type. One of the things that we viewed sort of negatively about Vandevart at the time we did the analysis was the the magnitude of the site. If the site becomes smaller, that generally would be unofficial. We really had no use for about 10 of the acres. And so it, it, it had a sort of a raining down effect on how we viewed that site as a whole. If you took a piece of it and said, well, is that acceptable for a, a use that we're talking about here, I would tend to say yes. Um, I think there's still some uncertainties there. I would be a little cautious about what uh, happens from a geotechnical sense. You know, I, I think that you want to make sure that you're you're going to be adequate in terms of the geotechnical, but it's the, geotechnical the same uncertainty. Uh, we want to make sure that the bearing capacities of the of the the site are adequate, but it would be the same due diligence that you would hold on a 23rd Street site or any other site. Um, and, and the thing to remember is we're we're never really as concerned with what's happening on the top four feet. It's what's under the top four feet. That's where the foundation bears. And that's the most important aspect of it. So we're concerned about what happens four feet down because that's where you sink a lot of money potentially without a lot of building space as a result. The city hall site, again, was from the, from the viewpoint of how big the building was at the time the analysis was done, held the project program. And in a smaller program, it would also hold the program. The challenge that we have on this site relative to slab on grade is that we have a building datum here, a first floor. That's two to three feet above the existing grade. And so the rationale at the time when we viewed the site was that with vehicle parking incorporated in the program underneath the building, that made a lot of sense. We've got a building that's up above the ground anyway. We've got something that could go in the basement that would have little programmatic impact and probably would house itself in, the, in a basement level quite well. If you looked at it and you said do a 40,000 square foot slab on grade building here, then we still have a parking issue we've got to deal with, which was the parking that was going to go below the building. And then we still have to deal with parking on the site. Um, so from the perspective of this, all of the sites, any of the sites that are bigger just give you more latitude in terms of design and then ultimately more flexibility. You can make more of those tie-breaking calls in a manner that allows you to control the cost than you can on less restrictive sites. Thank you. All the member Hassel. Thank you, Your Honor. John, could you just explain? I think the target is it 160 to 180 square dollars per square feet. Is that? Those are roughly the numbers. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. Then on this larger sheet here, I was just doing some math. Mm -hmm. If I understand it properly, then the last option on the far right, 8.8 .8 million, we can get about 32,000 square feet. Yes, that's a total project. Remember, the construction budget on that was 6.1. Okay, but now that's. I did, if you spread that $8 million, $8.5 million over 32,000 square feet, that's close to $300 per square foot. Again, that's project cost. Right. But if I spread it over $7 million, which is, I think it's 6 one I'm still over 200 Again, I'll go back to the calc sheet that I did at the very beginning to determine how big. And that's at 8.8 .8 if I take 2.6 of other project costs. It doesn't relate to square footage now. That's just what it costs to get the project built. What I end up with is 6.1 of constructed dollars. That's bricks and mortar, guys out there with tool belts on to build the project. And at that, the resultant residual square footage is about 32,000 square feet. So it's bricks and mortar, and then there's that 2.6 that's imposed on it that inflates that cost relative to construction cost. When we're just talking about construction cost, that's about what you would buy for about $6.1 million of building. It's 32,000 square right. feet. Now that would still be close to 200, 195 No, it should be about 180 bucks a square foot out of 5.7. Alderman Manny. Thank you. Remind me, please, Mr. Sabanash, the site here, mm -hmm. was that going to be a two story with parking beneath? Yes. That's what I understood. It, and again, the, the, the key on this site was always that the, the building was going to be up out of the ground anyway so that we aligned at the first floor. And so it lent itself to having something below it because you've really already bought about three feet of wall. It goes down another four feet to get to bearing capacity. That's seven feet of wall condition. If you go down another couple of feet, you've got your parking. So it, it lent itself to that definition 
uh, but it was always a multi-level design on this site. Do we want to go through the individual program items? I guess I'd be looking for Alderman Groff to let me um, know if you want me to do that or not. Probably not. Everybody has a copy of that. Okay. Um, and um, it was just suggestions that were made and uh, ideas that were tossed out. Uh, I know that they're, um, they're not all popular. Maybe none of them are popular, but <laughs> those, again, were done uh, based on what were large areas that we could do do something with, like for instance, when I it said on the on the list something about eliminate uh, um, the um, dispatch. Mm -hmm. For instance, that was defined as not eliminating it per se, but keeping it where it is in this existing building. If the part property were built here, mm -hmm. uh, there were other things that were eliminate. For instance, a fleet, and then that was explained well. You still need a place to house, maybe not the entire fleet, but to house at least a couple cars, just in case of emergencies in the colder months of the year, which we do get. So, uh, and those things would all have to be worked on. But these were talking points, and I'm sure, sure they're being talked about. Well, it, uh, as everybody knows, if you have a basket that's X big, you have to fit X into X basket. You can't fit more than that in, and it gives you a grasp of how um, um, significant the effort would be to try to fit it into that basket, depending on how you define what that basket is. President Byrd. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think one of the issues when you confront construction and dollars available is the pay me now, pay me later kind of phenomena. Uh, and uh, if I recall, one of the uh, approaches the school district used in their recent bonding effort was to uh, create a large building yet maintain some as unfinished space. So basically they had a larger building but had some maintained for future expansion. And if I recall Janesville to some de to a small degree they had some uh, of that building that had the HEVAC system in that had the availability to have portability of walls and some of the the, the infrastructure uh, sort of attributes that you would have in the building, but yet it wasn't finished off. I guess I would just value your observation on that approach uh, and the economy and the efficiency of doing something like that without having everything platted out, if you would. It's great if you can afford it. Okay. Um, but like everything else, um, if you're looking at the program reductions that we would be looking at, I would tend to say that would be low on the priority list as we move from point A to point B. I think that uh, you still have to size the system like it was constructed. All you really start to save is finished dollars. And although that's significant, it's not, in, in terms of the overall magnitude of the project, it wouldn't be the most cost effective way to control the budget. Then I do a follow up question. Uh, the and I know this is probably one you've been asked before, because uh, I think I even remember asking it, building uh, a, if you would, a first phase and second phase, where you have, uh, by plan, the ability to expand as your revenue picture changes. Uh, any comments you would have on that, or is that a popular construction model as you design facilities such as this? Uh, I think we would be uh, remiss if we didn't consider future expansion regardless of the scope of the project. I think our future expansion options are less prevalent here than other sites would be. I think if we, whatever we do here would tend to want to be constructed to its ultimate limit now because of the difficulty that's around us in building. And I think when you're paying that difficulty factor, you don't want to do it more than once. I think that later on the difficulty factor becomes more and more acute. Uh, on most sites that have the latitude, the land latitude to do it, uh, you just basically pick a direction and where you think you're going to grow and you leave a rectangle of space available and it's more logical. We've talked a little bit, I think even at the committee level, about the likelihood of building up and um, that just becomes a very difficult scenario to do over a 24-7, 365 operation. It's one thing to do it 
or something that even as minimally as over the weekend a roof can be torn off and replaced. It's very difficult to do in an operational police department building, so it becomes very difficult to see those scenarios playing out on this site. And even if we did it, we would probably say, let's compress the building as much as possible and expand out to accommodate expansion options rather than going up if possible. But there are certainly a lot of buildings that have uh, pre-investments and structural capacity and the like. It's just very difficult to do on top of a police department. Even easier on a city hall. You know, you're closed on the weekend. You can, you can tolerate that change in temperature and that change in conditions much more uh, readily than a police department can. Alderman Kittleson, you had a question? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, just going back to this uh, uh, needs assessment for the new police facility, John, did you go through all of these? Did, did yes. you look at them? And yes. so you do, I know we've addressed, touched some of them, but can you go over? I guess I would like you to go over some of these and, and well, let us know what you think. I, I can do that. Uh, first one is lobby. I've said this before, it's really hard to grasp, I think, for, for many people, but a lobby is a function of how many places you need to go from that lobby space. I could make a 100 square foot lobby if I only had to get in the vestibule and through a door. Lobbies are a function of access to departments, bureaus, toilet rooms, uh, other functions within the building that just have barrier-free requirements or circulation requirements. So Mr. it would be Seven, a great... Yes, if I just interrupt you, Alderman Hassel had a... I was uh, just wondering, do you have the actual square feet just as we go through this, just to put it in perspective? Sure. I, I, what I can do is I put a... I put my sort of go-no-go -go list <laughs> together relative to this. And so when I tried to figure out what, what could you do and where are we at relative to some of the decisions, uh, lobby space is programmed at 700 square feet. Uh, you could do 500, but until you actually start designing it and you know what you have to get to, it's hard to say that you could. Um, so I would tend to say that at this point in the design it would be no, but it, it could work out okay. It's hard to say. I mean, we're still very conceptual. We haven't put a building on a site yet, so we don't really know where things go relative to one another. Um, you know, to get to the 65,000 square feet, we made some modifications, and then there are some assumptions within this program that as we're reviewing City Hall relative to this project, um, we had done some things like put additional toilet space within the police department so we didn't have to remodel existing toilets in the building and do so more economically than it would be otherwise. If the PD were off-site, it actually, you'd reduce it by more than that. We'd go back to 120 square feet, which was part of the original program, and get more square footage out than was originally identified. So that was a, you know, that's one of those that you just look at and you go, well, why wouldn't we do it? Absolutely. On the administrative side, you know, I just can't answer an operational question. Um, that's really something for the chief to address with you. So I made it a yellow. It's not a, under no circumstances, it was, uh, you'd have to talk about it. I, I know that uh, how organizations are structured changes readily. Uh, the way we're currently organized as a, as a department, it wouldn't work. But I don't know what the chief has in mind. You know, I don't know if he's going to go to an assistant chief in the future, in which case there will only be one. I know that... Uh, Thinking about um, uh, deputy chief duties relative to investigations, you'd probably have somebody in another rank doing it. So I, I don't know that that would go into another office or not. But as a standalone concept, I think it's a major restructuring of the agency, and I can't really answer that. I think that's something that the agency would have to answer. You know, we did, there was really nothing identified in, in records. You know, communications, uh, dispatches are, are strange things in that they are becoming more and more sort of technologically self-sufficient. Um, you know, if you, you blend it in and became part of a larger agency and didn't have to construct the square footage, this is some of the more expensive square footage we have to construct. And so when we talk about the fleet being more economical, communications tends to be more expensive. If that didn't exist, it would help us budgetarily. But again, that's a that's a definition of a department kind of question that I can't answer. I know we currently have communications. To get us where we wanted to be 20 years from now, that's about how much space we would need. But whether it exists as it presently exists within the building is something I can't answer for you. I can only tell you that this is about how much space you need. 
I know that with the technology of the space that we have, we are going to be better off building it as new rather than remodeling it in this building. The technology relative to this, this section of the building is more economical for me to just build new than it is to try to replicate an existing. So if it were to stay in the building, I'm very strongly opposed to keeping it here unless we had to. I'd try to find another home for it and put something else in that could tolerate existing walls, existing infrastructure much more readily than state-of-the-art communications. On the training bureau, you know, classroom space, we, we cut it by 10% before. Could you make 1,500 work? You know, if you have a budget problem, you find a way to make it work. So I would do everything I could to do that. And you'd probably look at some of the other functions on this sheet, aside from the ones that are enumerated. I mean, I, we looked at the visitor toilet. I said, well, let me take both of them out. So there are some things on here that I think if uh, you progress from point A to point B, you'd look at very, very rigorously. And then when you, you sum this up, maybe you hit your 10% threshold that you are searching for by hitting one large space and finding a way to make it work with a number of different functions in it. And then some of the other spaces would be relatively unscathed. So, you know, on that one, I didn't really see any problems with it. I think fitness is a major discussion topic. I haven't done a state-of-the-art PD that did not have fitness associated with it. So, um, you know, police don't operate on normal schedules a lot of times. And so it's very difficult, although it's, it's realistic to say it could be done another way, the chance of it actually happening that way becomes slimmer and slimmer. It's like being in a health club anywhere. The farther you're away from your house, the chance of you using it goes down logarithmically, I think. So it's great to have it. So, I, I mean, I, I can't look at that and say, wow, that would be the, the magic bullet here. Uh, everything you're talking about would be, you know, you'd swallow hard and say, boy, what can we live with or without? On the fleet operations side, you know, there are agencies that have vehicle maintenance associated with them. We did one in Oak Creek. There are other agencies where we don't have it. West Ellis and Oak Creek have it. Uh, Franklin's a new building. Janesville's a new building. They don't have it. So, I, again, I, I view that as an operational discussion. Vehicle storage... Um, <sighs> It's the most contentious topic we ever have on police department facilities, and this is why, I think. It's because I have a car. Everybody in here has a car. Everybody knows what cars, where they want to be in the wintertime and things like that. And there are people who have their car, and it's not an enclosed environment. And so as a taxpayer, you look at that, and I mean, I park on the street. I'm in Milwaukee, and I have one garage space and two cars, and mine sits on the street. But I don't have a shotgun in it, and I don't have a couple thousand dollars worth of computer equipment in it, and I potentially have a defibrillator in it. And if I did, I tend to take that stuff and I tend to hide it in the car. <laughs> and, you know, enclosed vehicle storage is a very precious thing, and it's very important to most agencies. And most buildings that we do have some form of vehicle storage. Order of magnitude can be discussed from... Here to kingdom come, is it five spaces or 50, 20, or 24? Um, but virtually every police department that we've done work within uh, in climates like this has enclosed vehicle storage. Again, it's magnitude we're talking about. But it would be very difficult to just say unilaterally we're going to get rid of it. So that's a very tough, 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 tough question. So, that, I mean, those I view as largely... I can tell you what we're doing. I can tell you what everybody else is doing. I don't know that I can tell you it's the magic bullet. I, I can't prioritize for the department. And these, a lot of these are prioritizations. Uh, on detective side, I can, I can look at that and go, geez, to make the investigator's offices uh, about 112 well, square feet or something smaller. I know I can make an effective investigator office. I can't get a guest chair in. So if we're doing an, uh, an interview in that space and they were expecting to have somebody in their office... We're starting to get so small that I can't get some of the functions that were expected to be happening in that office in that office. And so when we look at that and then say detective interview, I mean, those are really the information gathering zones that the Bureau manages. It will have microphone technology, digital recording in, in terms of CCTV that are part of the Attorney General topics of how information is gathered by law enforcement that if you took it away, I think would be a real hardship. Uh, ID detective, that was future growth. I mean, I, you, when you get to the point where you're looking at 68 to 40, I mean, I think future growth is kind of off the table. And that's where shell space and all those discussion topics, from my perspective, I'd take the future growth and say we're not doing it. 
but again that one's not that's not my call either so but I think when you're looking at that order of magnitude change you have to take future growth kind of off the table that's a luxury then uh, in terms of evidence management I, it was something identified at about 700 I'm gonna say it was impound um, but I'm not sure so I was interpreting that uh, impound currently is housed off-site would continue to be housed off-site this is a place to process vehicles that are uh, uh, part of the chain of evidence so they have they have materials on them that are going to be removed by people within the agency evidence technicians to gather the evidence and it is optimally located proximate to the evidence storage um, so that would be a hard one you, you, we have two spaces I mean I tend to look at it and go geez can we make it one rather than getting rid of it as a whole on the patrol side again if I remember correct it was about nine percent there were I, I think two pieces that were identified dare and court services and I tend to think that you go with the stuff that has the least impact and you keep as much of the vital day-to-day -day stuff as you possibly can but you'd have to look at topics just like this across the board to achieve what you want to achieve prisoner processing and holding I don't know that you could make it work without this this is the place where every uh, patrol guy that wears a uniform comes in with somebody who is not acting in a way that's appropriate and I don't want those people in the building as a whole it's a tough space it's a tough space for tough people um, again if I was to approach this I would say boy you'd, you'd hit do you really need to have four interrogation rooms can you get away with two spaces in the vehicle Sally port rather than unilaterally saying we're gonna get rid of something or relegate it to the you know, alternate bid kind of profile or alternate bid um, methodology you know clerk of court area there can be another solution to that but again it, it's a it's easy to pick on the small things you, you, gotta, you gotta hit the big ones miscellaneous and shared sure I can make a smaller kitchen you know absolutely when you're running into a budget problem you hit the things that you can hit and you take advantage of everything you can take advantage of and then building maintenance uh, uh, like other things in the project a lot of this is ratcheted up by the size of the building so you make it smaller if you can but there is no magic solution here I can't say I'm gonna to go to rooftop equipment make the project I can make the project smaller it's not necessarily gonna be cheaper so I can do a lot of things that make the project order of magnitude less in terms of square footage but when we're talking about the the, the, the number it's a big number and so there would have to be you'd have to be looking at taking some bone away along the way it would be a very difficult process Alderman Hannah you had a yeah I just wanted to clarify on the the school district when they when they built out unused space uh, that was really at the end of the project and it was due to the fact that we had earnings in excess of our projected earnings so it was it was an after the fact discussion so I think when you go through this process I think you want to you want to have that short list of things you'd like to do if any other money became available and that's how that came about thank you is there any other questions Alderman Susha thank you mr. chairman um, just some food for thought it looks like if we were to eliminate um, building the garage at this point in time we would save approximately 1.7 million dollars is that true? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Each year, the council approves three to three and a half million dollars of capital improvements, and I don't know if down the road, if we could build this in phases, where perhaps, you know, two or three years down the road, this could come into capital improvements. The the need for it at that time could be evaluated, and if it's passed, um, it would easily fall into that budget if that's a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, just something to think about. And the other thing is, is that you had mentioned the hundred and eighty dollars a square foot is just an average. Um, I don't know if it would be possible, but if we used less expensive materials, perhaps we could get that cost down to about $140 a square foot. And in that case, then we would get almost 42,000 square feet of building space. So uh, I think that if we look at the, the type of building materials, that might influence how much we're actually paying. Um, that will be very difficult. I'm not going to say it's impossible, but there are... Um, let me just see if I've got the old. Um, again, the thing to remember is that um, I can do anything cheap. 
and that's not always in anybody's best interest to do it economically that way. Um, economically doesn't, I can always do something for less money. Maybe I misstated that. There are certain things that I think as a municipality with the trust of the taxpayers' money over the long haul, we wouldn't want to cheapen. So um, there are often projects where we will do alternate materials, alternate systems. I think that that's, given what we would have to do, all of those items are on the table for discussion. Um, but I think that the $140 a square foot would be very, very ambitious, uh, given the current bid market. Very tough. Vice President Serta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just going to shift gears. I understand we're talking about square footage. But just going back to your report, um, looking on page 10, again, um, going back to Vandervaart, it's mm -hmm. been earmarked that there's $150,000 for demolition um, or to vacate buildings and $25,000 for asbestos abatement. Um, if there's no, if we were able to... Um, gain a parcel there with no buildings, would that alleviate the yes. $175,000 cost? That would be a yes. cost savings. Yes. Then on page 9, for a walk-in cooler, um, it looks like at North 23rd it would be $5,000, but yet at Vandervaart it's $9,500. Oh, I didn't that? make any modifications off those gray columns. Okay. So I, I kept that intact because I, I, it was good to have a reference point from where we were. If we looked at Vandervaart... Um, and the same consideration that I took a look at at City Hall on 23rd, because those have been on the table longer, we would make the same critical assessments of that Vandevart project budget as well. And I think you'd see some of those numbers changing, but uh, much like that, that number didn't change at the top, it was a million five. If it becomes something else, then it's an interactive budget, so it, we can adapt it accordingly. And I'll just point out as well, too, and you. And like you, you had just given an explanation, but like for chalk and mark boards, um, nothing was earmarked for City Hall or 23rd Street site. And I guess I'm looking more as a comparable for 23rd because we're starting from nothing. But yet Vandervaart was charged $5,000 for chalk boards or chalk and mark boards. And then also under office furniture, I've noticed there's an excess of $75,000 charged mm -hmm. for Vandervaart versus the other 23rd Street site. I reduced those project budgets because they were 80,000 square foot and they didn't reflect how small the building was getting. Okay. And then acknowledging that we're talking about square footage, I, I couldn't go in with the same project budget on the furniture. And I, the chief would probably string me up. You can't spend money on furniture when you're trying to cut building program. I mean, they all have to be assessed unilaterally, and then they have to be prioritized. So I, I looked at it and I said, well, we, number one, we're going to have a smaller building. Number two, depending on how big the building is, those costs will probably still keep coming down. So Vandevart reflected just where we were back in August when we were reviewing the projects independently. Remember, that was an 80,000 square foot building that was imposed on all the sites. So it was significantly bigger. We would see those costs come down on Vandevart, much like I took a look at 23rd City Hall. So, would you say would that also reduce its costs here then? Yes. That 18 million. So yes. It isn't a current I mean, just I, I made this one. I called it interactive. So let's let's just say, for the sake of argument, that Vandevart that became 500,000, and construction was 10.9. And it's down to 15 million or something, and I haven't touched the other one. So, I, mentioned that Vandervaart. Pretty close. That is currently at 15 acres, whereas 23rd is at 3.6. So there could still be a reduction in cost if right, we I would do a five acre. Yeah, I would tend to say that the below. yeah the things that we had viewed that were Vandervaart peculiar, you'd take a look at because it's redefined, and you'd say that those assumptions maybe don't hold anymore. There may be something else that has to be assessed. But it would be, if you said look at Vandevart, then we'd do the same thing that we did with City Hall 23rd, and we'd say, okay, now that we know what this is, what are the impacts on the overall budget, and try to impose those same restrictions or benefits on the site the same way we did on the other two. Okay, thank you. Chief Kirk, if you could, um, I know we had asked you a while ago to come up, but if you could maybe comment on what we've talked about so far. Thank you, John. <clears throat> the, 
This discussion is a huge discussion and it can go on for hours and hours. Is it on? Yeah, you're on. It could go on for hours and hours. <clears throat> we must remember that we're striving to build a functional and a professional a police department here. When you build, you're building for 20 years out. We're not going to be building again. We've never, the city of Sheboygan has never built a police department. We've been housed in a city hall. A police department operates 24 seven, which means we have people on the road. And as far as a garage, there's a difference between maintenance area to do your work on a vehicle and a storage facility for vehicles. We are responsible for operating under emergencies, for emergencies. Last winter we had a detective that I happened to see. I was looking out the window. He was scraping his windows on the squad car that was parked outside before he could respond to a crime scene. <laughs> that should not be. We have buses parked in storage garages. We have fire trucks in storage facilities or in shelters, garages. We have dump trucks. We have garbage trucks and they're housed in garages. We do not have enough space in a garage for our squad cars. We have shotguns, we have rifles, we have computers. It takes approximately during the winter about a half hour to warm up the squad sufficiently to get the computers operating. And we are operating under a computer-aided dispatch system. So what, we, what now happens is the cell phones must be used for communication back and forth. We're striving for professionalism. For example, interview rooms. Right now, we have to tape record all juvenile interviews. January of next year, we must record all interviews in criminal prosecutions. Right now, we have one interview room in the detective division, which means my detectives at times must wait to interview the next person. They ask each other, how long is your interview going to take? Now, I used to be a detective. My interviews could range from a half hour to about two and a half hours. They're asking each other, how long is it going to take you? Because I want to set up an interview. That does not lead for professionalism, for efficiency, or for effectiveness. If you're going to build the police department, please give serious consideration to building it so it's functional. A garage, you must store your vehicles. We, we now have our vehicles located at four different locations. We, got, we have them off-site. Our drug vehicles are located in an off-site location and or they're taken home. We have a community, uh, uh, community policing vehicle that's kept at an off-site location. They're also located, vehicles are located at our impound garage, at our impound fenced-in areas. In our impound garage, we have evidence vehicles and we have department vehicles. We have an emergency response vehicle at the impound garage. We have our dive van at the impound garage. Yet we have a, another emergency vehicle, emergency response team vehicle at our garage downtown here. So if we have a complaint with weapons or a SWAT call out type of a, a call, we, we respond immediately from this location with an assortment of weapons and their equipment then we bring the rest of the equipment from an off-site location to wherever it's needed. We also store our vehicles, of course, in our, in our garage, which is located right behind City Hall. That has about enough space for 13 vehicles. We currently have 42 vehicles in our fleet. Or we have vehicles that are taken home. Now, the different sort of vehicles we have, we have a motorcycle, we have two trucks, a four-wheel drive truck, which we use to pull out vehicles when they're stuck in the snow or to get to emergencies during heavy snowfall. When you have an emergency during a blizzard, who do you call? You call the fire, you call public works, or at least we call public works to plow us a, a path to get there, or we use the four-wheel drive, four drive vehicle to get there for an emergency. We have another truck for the community service officers. We have unmarked vehicles, we have marked vehicles, we have drug vehicles, we have emergency response vehicles, we have electronic technician's vehicle, which is the Rush Shriner that handles the communications of the entire city and most of the county. We have a paddy wagon. For those disruptive people, we have a paddy wagon. Now, that, some of those vehicles are needed in-house, 
at the station. A paddy wagon, when you need it, you call for it. Sometimes it's on the road on busier nights, but for the majority of times it sits in the, in the garage until it's needed. We have different lifespans on each of these vehicles, and we have uh, worked on those lifespans over the years to get the most uh, years of service out of these vehicles. So as we, as we look at some of this, for example, our impound garage, it's an impound garage, but it's also used, uh, we have a shower, we have a bathroom there. For anyone that handles or gets uh, exposed to bloodborne pathogens, if they're exposed to blood on their, on their equipment, we send them down to impound and to keep them away from the general fleet and, and the general equipment where they can then take a shower, rinse off, down at impound, someplace you need a shower. You don't want to bring these people back to the department to use the in-house shower in the locker room because as you walk through the department you're exposing or you're you know, leaving a trail of blood or other fluids in these, in these other buildings. So now we have our shower down there. In the garage, if we use OC spray, we now have there a, a eye wash out area where people are under arrest. We bring them here, we rinse out the eyes and or take them up to the hospital for medical attention. In the impound garage, if I could get back to that location, we store evidence in that location. We store property. We have a storage of vehicles that are used in crimes. We store our uh, vehicles that are needed to be processed. We have an area there where we process um, evidence for fuming of fingerprints and different things of that nature because we don't have enough space in, in this facility here. We have, if you, it'd be very interesting, I, I wish we could show you some of our, and, and I would ask that before we make these decisions that we could then show you some of these locations to show you how tightly cramped we are in certain areas, especially, I'll take you pictures of the, of the evidence room. We won't go into evidence, but if we go down to impound, we have a three shelf system where it's from the floor up to the top of the, the ceiling and it's lined with property and or evidence. We have our, our property and or evidence located in various city, or in various city locations, impound, garage, a evidence locker in between uh, Deputy Chief Weiss's in my office. We also have it locked in the basement. We're, we're finding any nook and cranny to locate some of this property and or evidence, and we are, we are we're tight for space, obviously. So as, you know, when John, John ind indicates that some of these decisions are need to be made by the administration, he's absolutely correct because I'm going to have my name attached to this police department. Hopefully the construction is, is uh, completed during my tenure, but your names are also going to be attached to this police department. Do we need to look at it and to do the best we can? Oh, certainly. Certainly we need to do that. But to not to have a vehicle storage does not make sense to me whatsoever. Vehicle maintenance is another issue that we could discuss later. There's a lot of issues that we should discuss, we should hear from us, you should have your questions answered, and then let's make a decision on this. But you cannot be in a northern climate without a garage for your vehicles. You just, you just can't do that. Because if you don't have a garage, anyone who comes in and processes a person or has an evaluation or takes a break, they come out, if their windows are fogged over, when we respond to an ambulance call, we don't have time to wait and scrape off windows. During the winter, they park them inside the garage so their windows are clean. Chief, if I could just ask you to, uh, to, to tell us, what does the state require us, how long to save the evidence with evidence storage? If I remember correctly, we're required to save certain types of evidence for a certain amount of time? If it has DNA evidence on it, blood, fluids, body uh, fluids, it's required for the life of that person or until he is, is out of incarceration. But if you have a homicide or something that a person receives a life sentence, that must be retained for that person's incarceration period. So basically for life of that person. So that's, that's those types of, of uh, pieces of evidence. Now, if you have a misdemeanor, a misdemeanor can be charged any, anywhere, I believe, Bob, if I'm still correct on this, seven years or six years. Um, so if you commit a misdemeanor, 
we have the evidence, we can still charge you six to seven years after that. But now if you're incarcerated because of that, now we have to hang on to that incarceration. If it has DNA evidence and or other evidence which could um, be used later for your innocence, um, we're required to do that. So some pieces for life. Is there any other questions for Chief Kirk? Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chief, would it be a possibility for a garage that would be immediately adjacent to the regular building that, you know, if I could use a name like a butler building that possibly could be made, you know, less, less expensive than the main structure, but have a garage, but like a butler building that could be made less expensively than having it part of the main structure? I mean, would that, if, if it financially would work to save money, would that be something you could live with? In speaking with John Sabinash, we would sit down and discuss that. If that's feasible, we must remember that it has to be alarmed. So it, it's not, for example, just recently we had a, a vehicle, an evidentiary vehicle in our impound area, and it was stolen. It was stolen from the police impound area. Should not happen. We should not have egg on our face, but it was. Now, if in fact we can build a cheaper designed building, a storage area, absolutely. Absolutely. What we're trying to do is, we understand there's a tight budget. We, we do. But please, let's build what's needed and what we can afford. But <clears throat> our vehicles that are left out, outside, we have them damaged. We had blood spl uh, splattered on them. We had, um, when the ATF was here, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, we had their vehicles slashed, or the tires slashed on our vehicle. <laughs> That's not right. It should be locked up. We, we lock up buses and other city-owned vehicles. Thank you. Alderman Manny. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Simple question. Uh, with the fleet space as currently proposed, uh, I presume that includes vehicle maintenance, but I can't remember. Is that correct? I believe we would be asking for vehicle maintenance also, yes. So the 17,000 square feet would be adequate for that as well? I believe so. Alderman no, Sabinash, no, I'm sorry. You, you could comment on that? Or I'm sorry. Alderman? Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Sabinash. <laughs> you don't want that job. They're all lumped in, but they're two separate components. So the 17.5 is pure vehicle storage, but there are other functions enumerated on that sheet that incorporate uh, bike and bulk storage, decontamination, and then other vehicle maintenance items. And I think that actually has a radio shop on it, too. Go ahead. If I could just uh, explain how we purchase our vehicles, there's different ways of purchasing squad cars. One is to come fully equipped. We don't do that. We buy a bare bones, stripped down version of a squad car. And then we have Dave Daniels, Rush Schreiner, Rick Nye work together to put the pieces together because we use the same cages year after year. We use the same shotgun and rifle cage uh, holding rack. So we use the same things over and over, and we devise our own little uh, efforts to cut down the cost. So in that area, for the, the radio uh, repair area and things of this nature, that's why it's essential because some of these vehicles, if they're on, if they can be worked on, they're worked on with the crew that is at City Hall. Alderman Meyer. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if this would be moved to the 23rd Street site, could not the salt shed that is now standing on 23rd Street, could that not be used for something for storing cars? And could not the garage we have right now still be used? I'm trying to remember what I... I what I saw of a salt shed over there, I don't believe it could be used for vehicle storage, but I could be wrong. As far as using the current garage yet for vehicle storage, as you try to get more efficient with your operation, over the years, when, when, I, when I worked patrol, we would be given a squad number. Dave, your assignment today is squad 14. Bob, yours is 15 and so on. And you would wait for that vehicle to come because it's a vehicle main, uh, management system. Now we give a key, they're all keyed the same, and say when a squad comes, you grab the first one that's available to get on the road at roll call, there, which is downstairs. If you locate your vehicles someplace else, 
you have to wait to get your cops, your patrolmen, community service officers, whomever, to the vehicles. You're cutting down on the efficiency, and when you need a vehicle at a certain location, right now we go outside, we jump into a car, we take off. If you have to wait to get our officers from City Hall down to Public Works and or from 23rd Street down to City Hall, you're, you're wasting about estimated 10 to 12 minutes one way, get the cops in the car, what cars do you have to transport, and, and uh, but it's very, very inefficient. Very inefficiency, uh, or very, very inefficient, especially as you're looking at times where you're trying to get better and better and respond uh, to uh, the number of complaints we have. Alderman Racky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess the question I would have is, <clears throat> with today's newer technology, what type of vehicle maintenance do we do in-house today? Is it more or less just tire changes, oil changes, routine maintenance? What do we actually do in-house today? And would that require us to have a full, full maintenance facility or just pretty much a bare bones because we don't do the major engine overhauls and things in-house? We do do engine work in-house, yes, we do. Uh, in fact, we just are doing one right now or we just completed one right now. Uh, for the most part, I would, I would say that that answer sh uh, should be provided to you by my mechanic, Dave Daniels. However, we do do a lot of preventive maintenance. We do advantage that we have downstairs is that if in fact an officer comes in with someone under arrest or for some reason uh, for evaluation or a consultation with the supervisor or what have you, Dave Daniels is aware, gets that vehicle in for some of the minor repair work. Uh, there was a vehicle that was brought in, um, the officer stopped in with a person under arrest last year where the uh, mechanic smelt the smoke, something burning, and there was a, the wires were um, catching on fire in the trunk last year. Uh, but he does a lot of uh, preventive maintenance. And one thing that he does not any longer uh, do because they can't is he would uh, deal with the, uh, the um, not a mechanic, but with the rotors or the the ball joints and he would even though there was no area to inject oil or grease into that area he would use a syringe which was a technique some of the mechanics were using to go sh to shoot through the rubber to inject the, the grease to keep them up and, and last longer now we're having problems with some of the rear axles because of that they're no longer able to do that because they don't have the the rubber gasket there so we're, we're having some rear engines, uh, I mean the rear axles, I should say, I'm sorry, that are, are seeing some, some damage and they need to be replaced this year. But I, I wish, I, I, I can't give you a full answer and I, I, that's a good question, I can get you that answer. Thank you, is there any other questions from the Alderman? Thank you, Chief. Then we'll move on in the agenda. Uh, Alderman Manning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like Rich Gebhardt for a moment uh, to speak to us just to put this overall conversation in perspective. And that would be uh, debt service on nine, twelve, or fifteen million dollars over the life of the bonding. So we'd have some sense of impact as to what the cost of a police facility would be on the average household in Sheboygan. And I think the uh, value of that average house would be important to note as well. We could then see where we stand in relationship to that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have some numbers here, I guess, and be pretty close to, I think, what Alderman Manny is requesting. Um, I did a uh, projection. Actually, this was done one year ago this month for this, this study also. Um, at 8.8 .8 million, uh, we'd be looking somewhere around, uh, if you take an average parcel, being around a $100,000 parcel, uh, probably around $40 uh, per year um, for a 100,000 parcel. That's over you know, a 20 year period, of course. Um, I have another projection that was made at, at 16 million and um, that would be um, around average around sixty to seventy dollars per thousand per per year for a hundred thousand parcel. 
Um, generally speaking, you're looking at for the interest on the principal as being about over the 20 years, about two thirds of the principal amount. So if you're looking at for every one million, you're looking between six hundred and seven hundred thousand dollars of principal of interest over twenty years. Um, so I guess you know on, on that basis, uh, I guess for every one million dollars, it's, it's about five dollars per year for a hundred thousand dollar parcel. Well, that answers the questions. Alderman Susha. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, do those dollar figures include uh, the additional expense of the um, utilities and the extra maintenance people that would be needed to upkeep the facility, or is this just to borrow the money? This is just a debt service. This is just the interest on uh, issuing the debt. So there would be additional costs on top of that that would also... Right. The operating up. costs would not be included in the debt issue. Thank you. Am I, am I correct to believe this? Those numbers also include land acquisition? Well, they, they would include that level of principal. It would be up to the council how they would allocate that, how much to land, how much to building. Alderman Graf. Thank you. Just, just so I get this straight. For a $100,000 home, you said $40, and that's $40 per year, not per thousand, though. That's per year on a hundred thousand dollar home, correct? Okay. And that forty dollars would be for the debt service on borrowing six point eight million or uh, eight point eight million. Oh, eight, 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 okay. Thank you. Alderman Bourne. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Rich, would you go over? Uh, I, I maybe missed something. What would be the yearly debt service on on the eight point eight million? Um, it is going to, of course, vary. You know, we'd be looking uh, initially in the first year because this would be a part year's, half a year's interest or so, it'd be a couple hundred thousand uh, to, depending on, again, on what level you borrow, it could be a couple hundred thousand to, you know, 360,000 or, or so, depending on so for a level full, you borrow. For a full, well, let's say, let's say assuming uh, if we did a full, you know, 2007 for the full year, what would be the, uh, what would be the debt service? Uh, when you're looking at uh, principal as well as interest on there, uh, you're looking around 600 to 800,000, depending on what principal schedule you're at and what the interest level is. Per, per year? Per year, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other questions for Mr. Gebhardt? Alderman Meyer? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, do you have any um, operating cost projections for the new um, police facility? I don't have that with me. I think last capital improvements program, there were some operating costs that were included in the request, but I don't have that available with me right now. I could get that for you later. It was made by the police department when they surveyed some other similar new buildings. Thanks. There's no other questions. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we'll move on to the agenda. Uh, we'll move on with resolution number 580607 by Alderman Ryan and Serta requesting that the Common Council, by way of the Committee of the Whole, accepts new information and a proposal regarding the Vandervoort property located on South Business Drive and Broadway so that it may consider such site for the future home of Sheboygan's new police station. Alderman Ryan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, since uh, the Vandervert property was uh, uh, basically uh, tabled as an option um, last year, whenever uh, it was, it was chosen not to be the site. Some uh, some things have changed. I do have a letter here, which was given to me by the folks at Vandervert today. Um, which states, uh, since last summer, Vandevart has proceeded with plans to renovate the property owned at 14th Street and Broadway Avenue with the intention of either relocating some of our other sites to this one or preparing the land for sale in whole or in part. Um, 
Since Van de Vaart may be staying on a portion of the land, we are now in a position to consider selling parcel or parcels rather than just the whole property. The land is of varying value, and as stated in the appraisal done last year, smaller parcels are worth more than the whole 17.67 acres as one parcel. Price range per acre is $125,000 to $175,000, depending on the location of the acreage. Obviously, the corner of 14th and Broadway is the most valuable. Attached are recent maps in the Phase One environmental uh, study previously provided to the Council. Vandervaart has been involved in talks with a company needing to get rid of clean fill and willing to provide such fill free of charge. Vandervaart would be willing to put the city in touch with that company if the city so desires. Vandervaart is also willing to offer the city the right of first refusal on the rest of the <coughs> acreage at the site should Vandervaart decide to relocate. Uh, this came from Vandervaart Company uh, today. Um, basically, uh, in my speaking with Mr. Harvey at Vandervaart Company, uh, Mike Harvey, the owner of Vandervaart, um, the, there is 17 and a half acres, 17.67 acres uh, total. Now, Vandervaart presently has their offices and the majority of their uh, operations uh, moved up to the um, north end of the property, which is the higher ground and uh, actually exits on 15th and 16th Street. Um, they are in the process of vacating, uh, including removing the buildings on the south end of the property, which uh, borders uh, South Business Drive and Broadway Avenue. Uh, and from what they provided to me on the property site, um, they pointed out that they would possibly be willing to partition off, which they did provide me some maps. I wish I had more of them. But basically, the uh, higher ground bordering um, the rear of the property, which would be the Broadway Avenue, uh, with uh, the higher ground, it's approximately five, six, possibly seven acres. They would partition off. Uh, four to five of that if the city was willing to make an offer on it. Uh, this is the, the ground which uh, borders the alley in the rear, uh, would have access to 16th Street and also Broadway Avenue. This is not the lower property, uh, what is known as the hole on the property right now that has a couple of existing buildings. Uh, they are planning on, on demolishing those buildings and moving forward with the filling of that particular property the property that I believe that the city may be interested in looking at is the higher ground. It is level ground and uh, I believe would be suitable for uh, the uh, police department. Thank you, Alderman Ryan. Uh, Alderman Graf. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, um, number one, I'm sure we'd all like copies of, of that if, if available. So. Um, as soon as we can get them, um, that would be appreciated. And where, where in proximity to this acreage are the railroad tracks, which? The rail, railroad tracks presently are on uh, South Business Drive, which is the front of the property. OK. Uh, the railroad tracks are no longer used, but it is still owned by the railroad. Mm -hmm. The property we are speaking of here is on the rear of the property, entering off of Broadway and 16th Street, which would be the high area. OK. All right, so that's, they're not even close to the railroad tracks. No, it's not close to the okay. railroad tracks. Okay, thank you. Alderman Hanna? Yes, Alderman Ryan. Uh, to the best of your knowledge, the acres you're talking about, has there ever been a structure on those? On the higher ground, according to the phase one environmental, there, there, there is no record of any structures on that particular ground. Uh, there is a large berm which is strictly an earthen burn that they, uh, they erected to try to uh, uh, keep some of their beautiful operations uh, uh, away from the view of the neighborhood. Uh, this is strictly dirt. It was piled up uh, by uh, Van der Berg about 15 years ago. Um, it could be, it's, it, it's strictly earth and could be leveled out just as easily. I do have uh, copies of the phase one environmental here also. Thank you. Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Alderman Ryan, could you do, uh, repeat those figures on what the possibility, the cost per acre would be? Uh, a little more. Van, the, oh. Vandervaart threw the numbers out here that they said that uh, 
price per acre is 125,000 to 175,000 depending on the location of the acreage. Obviously the corner of 14th and Broadway being the most valuable or is the most valuable. What they're speaking of there is what is presently the area which is sunken in, which is your corner of 14th and Broadway as far as any retail space. That's what they're talking about, that being the most valuable property because of the, the visibility of it, obviously. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Recchi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 16th Street is the access to that property. There is no access from that upper area to Broadway Avenue. Um, there is a church and a manufacturing facility between the alley and uh, there's a couple parcels up there. How would we get around those people? Would we have to erect the street? What's the possibility? Because right now the only way in and out of there is 16th Street off from Georgia Avenue. There is a cutout presently, a curb cutout on Broadway Avenue. It's approximately right here. Uh, if this property were, were leveled off and if this is indeed filled in, there would be a, an entrance right on Broadway Avenue. 16th Street in accordance comes in on the other end of the property. If you're looking at the, at the high ground up here, could be coming in down here and also here. Uh, the alley is behind it, but obviously uh, I don't believe the city is going to be interested in using alleys for uh, police vehicles. My, just a quick follow-up question. Now there have to be some more fill in here to level this thing out to get squad cars in and out. What are the regulatory on all this fill? I mean, we, we're hearing fill, we're hearing stories about local companies wanting to drop clean fill. What is the regulatory on that with the DNR? Is there special permits or things we'd have to get? Maybe Mr. Holton could answer that question. If I can answer one portion of it, uh, the, the fill that uh, Vandervaart is referring to right now uh, is uh, a, a company um, which uh, disposes of, which finds new homes for uh, foundry sand which is a clean fill. I mean, it's, it starts out as sand. You put your, 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 your uh, foundry work into it, and afterward the mold is, is crushed and turns back into a sand. It's clean fill. It is, not a, it is not hazardous. It is not a pollutant. That is the majority of what they would be looking to use in order to fill up the low ground on this property. But again, I'd like to just ask, what are the regulatory and, and sand and things like that? I mean, is, is it... Uh structurally sound? I mean, is it going to crumble apart like it does in the beach? I mean, Mr. Holton, again, Mr. Holton can maybe answer that question. Mr. Holton, if you could come up and uh, answer that question for us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you would need a permit from the DNR to for land disturbing activities, uh, which is, there's a fee for that. I think it's based on the amount of land that's disturbed. There's a fee with the city also for that, for inspection of the erosion control. And the material I'm assuming you're talking about is like foundry sand, and that is possibly used for fill. We've used it before on bridge approaches. The Mill Road Bridge front we used it for. So it is possible. Alderman Groff, did you have a question for Tom or? Not on this particular issue, but on okay. another issue regarding the acreage and so forth. All right. Go ahead. Oh, um, I believe you had said that the most expensive would be the smaller portions. The most expensive, what they referred to, would not be the smaller portions, but would be the most visible portions, which could be used for, for retail use. Okay. Then, if we purchased a four to five acre site, what what is... I guess, what is the, the size of the site that we'd have to purchase so that wouldn't be considered a, um, well, uh, too small for them to for, split up? No, from my understanding, they would, be, they would be willing to part with four or five acres. Okay. And that being on the, on the front end, what they consider to be the more, realistically, the more expensive sites would be the retail sites that could be developed for retail with uh, you know, visibility. Okay. And are they willing to... This one hundred and twenty-five to one hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars per acre. Are they willing to negotiate that? I would think so. That would be up to uh, Mr. Harvey and Vandervaart if it gets to that uh, gets to that point. Is there any other questions for uh, Tom Holton? 
Mr. Chairman Ryan. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Holton, speaking with uh, the folks at Vandervart, they, they said that this foundry sand could be compacted to a 98% compaction ratio. Does that make sense to you? Yes, it does. Okay. You have to would, do some things on the outside of the slopes. You have to encase it in clay. And, but, <laughs> it, but that would be suitable for building upon then at that? Uh, I believe so. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Mann, did you have a question? All right. Alderman Bourne, did you have a question for Tom Holton? No. Okay. Tom, you can sit down. Uh, Alderman Manny. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This question is for Paulette Enders. Uh, I think she remembers, in all probability, what the uh, price quoted a year and a half ago was from Vandervaart. How does that price per acre compare with what they're asking today? Paulette, if you could come up here. Thank you. And simply as she's coming forward, I will note that last time around they were not willing to negotiate the sale price. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my recollection was, and I don't have the information in front of me, that it was approximately 100000 per acre and it was approximately 18 acres. And it does sound like 17.67 is close to that. And at that time, they weren't willing to parcel off. And I think the, the study that Tom and I performed did note that in the, when we looked at the Vandevart site. Okay, thank you. Did you have some? Alderman Serta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it, there's just one thing I want to reiterate and then just um, get into some things for food for thought for the council and the public. And that is, out of everything said here tonight, one of the biggest things that surprised me is that the study that we received from Mr. Sabinash took into consideration all the old information concerning Vandervaart, but um, he did give a fair assessment as far as the costs conducive to the City Hall and 23rd Street site, roughly looking at $15 million. The questions that I asked to make those adjustments, given the new information that we have with Vandervaart, puts it pretty much comparable at 15 million. Mind you, that's with a 15 acre site still. There could still be some reduction in cost that would go below the 15 million dollars. That's something to think about. Um, what was said here tonight is Vandervaart's looking at $125,000 per acre or $175,000 per acre, depending on where we would like to put our police station. Um, when you look at the 23rd Street site and you take into consideration from the proposal or the resolution that Groff and the other members had submitted, um, assessing the value of 23rd at $940,900, subtracting the city's portion, um, you come to an estimate of $627,266. I won't go into um, equating taking off the portion of the parking lot because I believe that's can be debatable. But if you would divide that by 3.6 acres, we're willing to pay 174,000, roughly about 174, $175,000 per acre at 23rd Street site. Mind you, again, the cost could be reduced from that 15 million because they're basing that on 15 acres. Um, I did some checking today concerning our parking lot, and I won't go into any great detail, but I was surprised to learn that um, we could focus on shared services with that parking lot. Um, speaking with parking and transit, um, I found out that there's 33 open stalls still available. If there's such a need for the county, I think it would be a win-win situation if they would utilize our parking spots. Um, that could give the city $16,524 per year in generating revenue off that parking lot. If it's in such high demand, why aren't we working together and providing those slots to the county or they inquiring and utilizing those spots? Um, and some would say, as, as far as the cost concerning that, I don't know if the public is aware, but the county just um, purchased 10 slots and adjacent to our parking um, stalls there and paid $91,000 for 10 slots. That equates to about 9100 per stall. If you would take that same amount, $9,100, and times it by 51, which our stalls are, that equates to about $464,100. The county could have, just for taking our 33 stalls that we have left, could have those stalls for the next 43 years. 
So um, I think there was a lot of things mentioned tonight. And again, if we're looking at the bottom line as dollars, it has been said by Mr. Sabinash, 15 million for Vandervart. You've got a central location. Mind you, that's with 15 acres. Imagine what we could do if we could still go in and negotiate with Vandervart. Um, I have spoken with Mr. Ryan, and I've taken into consideration as to what is the best way to proceed to actually get a final document, the final cards on the table with Vandervart. Um, and this is something Mr. Ryan is, able, is willing to do, and myself, um, and I would also ask Paulette Enders to come along with us, to go to Vandervart and to get a last deal. Um, I'm, I'm saying myself and Mr. Ryan, because we've built a rapport with Vandervart, we've, we've all acted professionally and with the expertise of Paulette, I think we could do the city some justice. Um, so I will be bringing in a resolution asking the council to allow us to do that. Um, we won't be making any decisions. That's for the council to decide, but it would give you the final proposal. But this was just the, the, just the first information that we could provide for you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll, I have some other people to get quick. <laughs> Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Uh, just for a point of information for the for the council and the citizens that are living uh, list, uh, watching on television, I called the uh, county treasurer's office last week and I got some uh, assessed values and some uh, fair market values on on both of the Vandervaart properties. The first one is located at 1436 South 15th, the, the larger of the two properties. These are this is for 2005 Department of Revenue assessment. Uh, the property was assessed at $574,500, and the fair market value of that property was $710,070. On the property at 1440 South 16th Street, the 2005 assessment on that property was $144,200, with a fair market value of $178,230. So if the fair market value is $710,000, on that entire property, uh, I would hope that they would be willing to sharpen their pencil a little bit on the cost, cost per acre that we're going to be negotiating. <laughs> so it's just a point of information on this. These are the most current assessments and fair market values on those properties available. Thank you, Alderman Racky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, if we purchase say five acres of the uh, Vandervaart parcels up there uh, off from 16th Street, are we not obligated to pay some relocation costs here to help them relocate to other parts of the uh, property? Alderman Ryan, do you have an uh, answer to that? Yes, thank you. Uh, actually, the par parcel of property we'd be looking at here is no, it does not have any Vandervaart buildings on it at this point. Uh, the Vandervaart buildings are located over here off of 16th Street and 15th Street. The buildings which are down in what is referred to as the hole here, they are in the process of planning demolition on those and filling up this hole. The property I believe we should look at is the high ground up here and there are no structures on that property. Uh, President Perg. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think attendant to our moving towards the bottom line for comparison, uh, I guess one of my interests in, involved, uh, what would be the relative use of that property? Because as soon as we, we have very few cornfields left in the city of Sheboygan. This is a rather large property uh, that has multiple use and the best and highest use had previously been determined uh, uh, not to be municipal. Uh, so uh, what I ask, and I think uh, all the council members and the media do have available, uh, an estimate of comparable value and also a tax pro forma in terms of the amount of tax we would expect to generate uh, legitimately from that property. Uh, the comparable was provided by Paulette, which interestingly was the Imperial Motel site. Uh, those of you who have been around for a while recall that that was a very popular site uh, back in the year 2000. Uh, at that time, I think a very significant cry came up to say that uh, it wouldn't be in our best interest to take that off of the tax roll. Uh, interestingly enough now, I believe that the tax value of that property, and again, I can't just speak to what it was when the Imperial Motel was on it, but now it approximates some $7 million. Uh, 
Uh, that in line then, the comparable that uh, Paulette, the planning staff, and the assessment staff provided was that it would be reasonable to assume that the uh, State Highway 42 and Broadway area, four or five acres in that particular vicinity, would likely support a development of some $3 million. A $3 million development uh, brings in about $100,000 per year of taxes. Uh, over a five-year period, obviously, that brings in close to a half a million dollars uh, plus in terms of property tax revenue. And I think as we move towards some conclusion in terms of the site, that for me is significant because once you take something off of the property tax rolls, it's gone forever. Uh, and the pro forma takes it out to 50 years, which the assessment department felt would be a reasonable life of property. So I believe you have that roll up to consider in our future deliberations. Thank you. Thank you, President Berg. Uh, Vice President Serta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Then I would also ask that we give the same credence to 23rd Street site because if indeed we do go to Vandervart um, or if we went to 23rd, how much of a tax base would we lose if the county so chooses to sell it to a developer? We need to do that <coughs> same comparison. To address um, Alderperson Warren, I've also did some checking because I wanted to know in terms of the assessment value. The city assessor's office has um, assessed 23rd Street site at 940,900, but yet again, Vandervart coming in at 574,500, that being at 17.33 acres. And I said, how can you have 3.6 assessed at almost a million and 17? Here's a disadvantage for Vandervart. They're zoned industrial, whereas the county site is zoned for office and business use. But indeed, that's exactly what we'd be using the Vandervart site for. So that's why you have that fluctuation. So if you're going to do a fair comparison, you should keep that in mind. Thank you, Vice President Serta. Alderman Montanar. Um, thank you, Chairman Vanderwill. I think Alderman Berg had good points about not taking property off tax rolls. Alderman Serta had good points. Maybe the county will sell that and we'll get some tax revenue. I would like, if we could, to ask the Director of Public Works, Tom Holton, and City Development, Paulette Enders, to give their opinion about the sites and see what they have to say, because they're, they are our experts. I would like their opinion and their insight. Thank you, Alderman Montemarro. Alderman Racky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I actually, before I should have specified, I would like Paulette Enders to address the relocation question. I believe there's relocation costs regardless if they sell it to us or we go asking them uh, to help them relocate because we're buying part of their property. So Paulette could address that. We dealt with it the last time. Paulette, would you be able to address that? While she's walking up, I just want to let you guys know we're going to need a, a motion eventually to what we want to do with this. Hold it or uh, advise council on what we want to do with this document. Paulette. Thank you. Um, it depends. Sometimes, you know, and I think um, Alderperson Ryan had said that they wouldn't be relocating any buildings. They're, you know, if they're potentially willing sellers. You may not have any relocation costs. Typically what we do is, you know, we have discussions with the city attorney. We ask him that question. If we're going to move forward in purchasing a property, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. And I know that's, um, you know, not a good answer at this time, but we usually do consult with the city attorney on this one. Okay. Alderman Rack, do you want to hear from the city attorney or are we good? I guess... Okay. You know, and Thank I would you. just, you know, at this point, if you aren't relocating them out of the business, if they're just parceling off a portion of the property, you know, if it's not impacting their business at all, as my guess you, is you wouldn't have any. Thank you. Uh, is there any other questions for Paulette? Okay. Uh, Alderman Meyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
I guess this is kind of a comment. Um, I'm, I'm rather surprised that this property is still on the market. We were told last year that you know people were lining up to buy this Vandervart property. And um, uh, Alderman Ryan um, has had private meetings with the company, and apparently they are talking about other retailers buying some of this property. Do they have people lined up? Who else will be buying this property? Because I do have concerns about taking it off the tax rolls. Thank you, Alderman Meyer. Alderman Ryan, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, number one, I have not had any private meetings or dealings with, uh, with Vandervart regarding this property, and there has been, not been any discussion about other retailers coming on board in this property. Uh, as a business person who has bought and built retail locations, it is my own personal observation that the back portion of property here, the portion that is not the most visible from the main route of traffic, is the least valuable portion of property. The piece of property that is the most visible and the most accessible to the main traffic flow is the most expensive piece of property and therefore suitable for, re for a retail location. Regarding tax, taking this off of the tax rolls, if you take off this back portion of property, if we take four or five acres off of the back portion of the property, which is not highly visible and therefore not highly suitable for retail, on the main drag here, uh, that taking that five acres off and, and, and developing that as a police department will make the front portions of this property that much more valuable to whoever builds them for retail, for retail, and therefore that much more valuable to the tax rolls and to the uh, to the uh, coffers of Sheboygan. Put it that way. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Ryan. Vice President Serta. Um, uh, just addressing older person Racky's concern, I think it was stated in the communication from Vandervart, their intents on their property. Um, but again, that's something that we could actually negotiate and put in writing that if, if there is that concern. Um, Mr. Harvey is um, a man who deals with his business with integrity, and um, you'd be amazed at how far he would go. Um, he's just, he's um, just shown a lot of faith in the city. Um, he understands that um, this deal could be a win-win for all of us. Thank you, Vice President Serta. Alderman Graf. Thank you. Um, Alder President Serta had mentioned um, being able to talk to um, the Vanderbart people and so forth. Um, what kind of time frame were you looking at, and um, how quickly can you do this? Vice President Serta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in order to do it legally, I'd spoken to Steve McLean earlier today. I would have to bring in a resolution at the Common Council to have you, the Council authorize myself, um, Alderperson Ryan and Paulette Enders to meet with Mike Harvey and we can get that um, back to the committee as whole as soon as possible, um, willing that we have another meeting. Um, so as I'm sure as whatever Mr. Harvey's schedule is like, we could do it as soon as possible. But I have to wait until the next Common Council to bring in that resolution. Well, it wouldn't have to go back to the Committee of the Whole. It could go directly to Council, and Council could discuss it there also. Okay. I mean, that would Anything save you some time. Anything more time efficient. Thank you. Um, I'll go to President Byrne. Uh, uh, thank you. Just a, a question of Vice President uh, Serta. Uh, is there a reason you wouldn't use the Building Use Committee to enter into negotiations in as much as they're already particularly invested in the process uh, and uh, I think perhaps have uh, a, a broader base of knowledge in terms of some of the issues that relate, if you would, to citing a poli the, the police station construction as a whole rather than having a separate group of older persons do that? Uh. Do you want to comment on that? Vice President Serta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm not sidestepping um, utilizing building use. If anything, I'm enhancing it. I'm adding more older persons and making that decision and determination. Um, and also, just given the last practice, um, the way we did dealings with Vandervart in the past, and um, Mr. Ryan um, is very business-minded, and again, we built that rapport with um, Vandervart. There's a trust factor that we've built there. Um, it, again, going back to the last dealings that we had with Vandervart, I think they feel comfortable with us, and I believe that we can give the city the best deal if you send us in. Thank you. Alderman Susha. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to make a comment on how lucky the city really is, because 
it, I don't think we have a bad site on the table. I mean, we've got City Hall, the 23rd Street, we've got Van der as options. You know, I've heard people kick around the Sunny Ridge idea, the Health and Human Service building in the old, you know, clinic location. You know, the Sheridan Park was an option. We have lots of options that we've looked at over the years, and there are larger cities like New York that aren't as fortunate as Sheboygan. Um, I think wherever we wind up building, people are going to be happy that it's finally built. And I want to say that tonight, for the first time, I'm glad we finally had a conversation of what we are going to build. Because in my opinion, what we are going to build is by far more important to me than where we're going to build it. So I'm hoping that we can put this issue behind us soon. Time really is becoming of the essence. Because if we're scheduled to break ground in, in January, if we keep bringing in new sites um, to be looked at, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about breaking ground in a timely fashion. So. Um, whatever we do, we need to keep the wheels moving forward, and I hope that um, we're able to do that so we can get into more discussions about what we're building, because we've spent years now talking about where to build, and I think we've spent a couple years too many talking about where, when the focus for the majority of the time should have been on what are we going to build. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Susha, and that's very important. We need to stay on the timeline, and I know it's the uh, mayor's priority, and I know it should be all of our priorities to stick with the timeline, no matter no matter what sites we look at. Um, I'm going to order. Alderman Racky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to call the question now. There is no question. <laughs> we have a resolution in front of us here. We, we need a motion. Uh, now, if we want to. Alderman Cerna. I'll make a motion to file it only because we've already um, done what I had asked, just that we would explore this topic. And again, I will be working on that resolution um, that will go before the Common Council. Because again, I don't believe we can do it here in the Committee of the Whole to allow us to negotiate. So again, I'm congratulating the Council that um, you allowed it to come here and to be explored. So with that, I move to file. Second. I have a motion and a second to file. Under discussion? Alderman Graf? Under discussion. Um, uh, I would support the motion to, to file as, as Alderman Sutter had, had pointed out, as she needs to bring in something new. But I'm just wondering with that new thing, will she be including the, um, the um, Building Use Committee in, in her um, uh, as part of the negotiating team or at least being able to attend and so forth? Because we do have a lot of information and, and several questions that we, we need to have answered. Um, building Use did all the, you know, they made the decisions and and presented that information to council one way or another. Right. So, and, um, and maybe if, if you don't want the entire building, there are seven members to the building use committee, and it includes um, uh, some a representative of the police department, a citizen representative, uh, and um, four older persons, and I'm forgetting someone else. Um, but um, anyhow, we, we are a, a different group than what the the previous building use committee was so. Um, oh, and, and an architect. We also have an architect uh, on the building use committee, so um, it's very helpful. I would be open to explore to allow um, Chief Kirk to attend or an architect to attend as well. With all due respect, this is something maybe we should be uh, you and Alderman Serta could discuss outside of Sounds outside right. of the Good community of the whole. That's fine. Thank you, Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my, my comments were the, along the lines of uh, Alderman Graf, so I'll also address my concerns with Alderman Serta after the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Perez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, earlier I received an email, and I, I see uh, Mr. Michael Leibman here. I believe he's been here for about two hours now. I don't know if he still wants to address the, uh, the committee of the whole or not. I'd like to ask that if he does, I'd ask that he address us, otherwise, no need to. Would you like to address us? I, I, I'm going to reserve comment at this time. Uh, we sent some information out, but I think quite a reserved comment. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Mayor, for, for bringing that to my attention. Alderman Montemar. Uh, thank you, Chairman Vanderweel. Um, my request to have um, our uh, city development and, our, uh, and Tom Holton speak. As long as we're about to vote on, on, on filing this thing, could I ask that my request to have them speak be put off until the next agenda item, number six? Sure. Which it will fit in there just fine also. Thank you. Alderman Susha. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In regards to the discussion of who's going to be going into negotiations uh, with Vandervaart, if we move in that direction, um, I, I really appreciate the resource. We recently received the handbook for Wisconsin municipal officials, and under the role of alder person, it clearly states individual alder persons are not empowered to act on behalf of the city and can only exercise power when a quorum of the council is present. So I'm questioning whether we have the right to go into negotiations at all because we are not empowered to act on behalf of the city. So if you can keep that in mind, perhaps it's best to just send city officials. Thank you. Uh, Attorney McLean, would you be able to address that for us? As, as I understand that comment out of the league handbook, that's talking about uh, an individual alder person without any direction by the Common Council. If the Common Council were to authorize an individual alderman or a group of alder persons or staff or whatever to uh, negotiate, that's, that's certainly uh, acceptable. Uh, the concern is an individual alderman on their own without any authority of the body going out and trying to negotiate buying a piece of land. Uh, what this is saying is that that individual would have no authority to do that, which means it wouldn't be binding on the city. Mm -hmm. um, um, and in any event, um, you wouldn't want to charge these individuals or, or committee with authority to bind the city in any event. You'd, you would want them to negotiate the best they could, the, the best deal they could, and uh, have that subject to approval by, the, by this body, by the council. Um, so you wouldn't want to give any sort of group authority to uh, bind the council to some final offer. Thank you, Attorney McLean. Uh, Alderman Radke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Steve, if you would, please, what is the normal course of negotiations? I mean, does it involve yourself, Paul Edenders, Tom Holt? I mean, what is the normal negotiating team? And we have our own experts in-house to deal with just such things here. And I don't see why we should go away from that just for this one particular issue. I think what we should do is follow the normal course of protocol that we've used all these years. I mean, what is a normal team? Well, I don't know that there is a normal. Uh, for instance, the negotiations on, with the county for the 23rd Street site was the Building Use Committee. The staff uh, also participated. I participated uh, as, long, uh, uh, as well as Kim Verhelst, purchasing agent, uh, Paul White Enders, the chief of police, deputy chief. Uh, but it was basically the, the Building Use Committee that negotiated with the county committee in that instance. Uh, you know, so I don't know that there is a, what you would call a, a precedent or a standard as to who negotiates what. Uh, in any event, that would be really up to the council. I think you'd want to make that decision, whether it's the Building Use Committee, a, a subset of that, a uh, subcommittee of the Building Use Committee, or uh, if an alder person proposes to have <coughs> individual aldermen, as long as the council authorizes that, that's... That would be what, what you would use in that circumstance. Um, you know, I just had one other comment since I'm up here. The question had come up about relocation costs or relocation expenses to Vandervaart. Uh, the issue of relocation really comes up in a, in a taking context, a condemnation context, uh, where the statute requires, uh, under certain circumstances, you've got to make business relocation payments or other relocation payments. But in a voluntary transaction, uh, that's, that's a negotiable item. It wouldn't be something that would be required by statute to pay relocation. Thank you. Alderman Serta. Thank you, Mr. Chair or Mr. Chairman. Um, I did ask the same question. What is the protocol used? Because I wish we would have used it last time with Vandervaart. But, um, and I guess I posed the question too, if you look at the way the process that building use had gained their last information to formulate their resolution, the county wasn't present. Um, William Gehring 
Adam Payne, they, did they come to the meeting to building use? No, I think when Steve mentioned the building use committee, he meant the, the three-member building use committee that negotiated originally with the county. Okay. This was just a, a suggestion that was brought into the committee as to what the county was looking for, I recall. So we, the building use committee, did not do any negotiating um, because we were waiting for direction from what the county, uh, the council wanted us to do. Alderman Graf, your light was blinking also. Did you have? Oh, that was what I wanted to. Okay, um, okay. We, we have the uh, motion on the floor to file. Uh, I'm going to just do a unanimous vote. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes. Moving on, to, first of all, I'm going to handle this kind of like the uh, Public Protection Safety Committee. If Anybody wants to speak on these documents in the, in the gallery, uh, raise your hand and we'll have you come up. Instead of having a public forum, we're going to do it that way. But we ask three minute limit and you have respect for everybody in the room, the alderman, mayor, everybody. And um, also the person writing it will, will get first dibs on speaking on it. And uh, so then RO number 104607 by the city clerk to minute communication from Mary Zarafanidis asking that the council revisit the new police station location and make an offer to the county for the North 23rd Street site. Uh, Mary Zarafanidis told me she wouldn't make it and I don't see her tonight. So, um, Alderman Montemar, you wanted Tom and Paulette to speak on this? On one of these, they, I would like to have their opinion about the sites. I thought it would be done on number, agenda item number four, but it wasn't, so let's put it on one of these because it all certainly refers to the police building sites. All of these do. All right. Um, Tom and Paula, could you come up and speak your opinion on the sites on Vanderbart, North 23rd, and City Hall? Yes, Correct. please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My opinion has not changed since we did that report. I still think city behind City Hall is the best place for the station. Look at all the, all the issues. It's already off the tax roll. Uh, with, the, with the Vannevar site, I, th I don't remember where we had that, if we had that around four or five, I don't recall for sure. But there, there's, uh, even with it buying five acres at 125000 that cuts the price down to, I think, half of what it was. But I believe that the government facility should be downtown, a central location. We have the post office, social security, the library, a lot of the banking. Uh, my opinion hasn't changed. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I agree with Tom. And then I'd also like to add that I mean, the, the two sites scored very close together with City Hall and the 23rd Street site. And also that um, what, what will happen when the police department leaves, you know, let's say they go to the 23rd Street site, we also lose that police protection for City Hall. And there's a lot of services that I think they provide to us that, you know, when they're in another location, a remote location, we, we lose those shared services amongst each other. And um, like Tom had mentioned, I also feel very strongly about keeping our government services downtown. You know, you think about all the police officers and you know, the lieutenants and the chiefs that are downtown, not only do they work downtown, but they provide, you know, a lot of downtown activity. You'll, you'll see them walking on the streets before and after work, shopping, you know, and taking advantage of all that downtown has to offer. And I do think that it would be a loss. Thank you. And, and I agree with you. If you look at City Hall and, and its departments, they work like an oiled machine. And if we take that away, we might, might disrupt the... Uh, the machine. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Chief Kirk, could you come up and make a comment? I think the entire discussion tonight has centered around the budget. How much do we have? How much can we afford? I think if you listen to John Sabinash tonight, he says, the cheapest construction will be slab on grade. I think he has said that the city hall site will be more expensive. And for that reason, 
I would say that, uh, and I believe the mayor and I in that joint news release indicate that we are concerned about the City Hall site. So therefore, slab on grade is at Vandervart and or 23rd Street. I think we should look at both sites, make a determination, keeping in the timeline, and then slab on grade construction at one of the two other sites, not City Hall. Thank you. Alderman Groff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was going to make a motion on, um, on that to bring it to the floor at RO. And, um, and I was also going to include my communication and ask that both those um, documents be placed on file. Second. Okay. I have a motion and a second to put our own number 1040607 and our C number 5400506 on file. No, no, no. Um, item number 6 and 7, not 11. Oh, I'm sorry. Because <laughs> 11 we still have to act on. <laughs> All right. I have a motion to file our own number 1040607, COM number 280607, and our own number 1050607. Under discussion. Well, not, I didn't say number eight, just six and seven, because right. I'm, I'm not sure if Mr. Uh, Pilling is here or not. Yes. Oh, he is. And I didn't know if All he right. wanted to speak because that would be his, as you called it, Mr. Chairman. Um, he was right if he wanted to, so. I apologize for the confusion. Um, Mr. Pilling, would you like to speak? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my thing is not so much having the police station in one particular area. Um, I feel that it needs to be close to the 14th Street corridor. Um, I think 23rd Street being three quarters of a mile from that uh, is not good from the, for the safety of the citizens throughout the city, especially as the city expands southward. And I don't understand how they possibly can operate economically when they're wasting all those extra miles with all the extra travel that's involved in that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion on those documents? All in favor of filing signify by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Motion, uh, any opposed? Motion passes. Uh, RO number 1050607 oh, by the city clerk submitted a communication from Jeffrey Bubb stating his concerns regarding the location of the new police station. Uh, Jeff, would you like to uh, come up? Um, okay, I'm sorry. So I would make a motion that that um, RO be accepted and uh, placed on file also. Motion a second to place the RO on file. Jeff, now if you could come up, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman, Town Council. Um, a couple things. Um, I mentioned. I remember hearing some talk about um, interest in the land around Vandervoort as possible uh, retention on a, on a taxpayer role, and, and that that land is suddenly important, like we, it might be beneficial for us in the future. I remember the same argument when we first considered Vandevoort that it was too much land to buy and that we didn't want to want to run the risk of having that much property without being able to sell it. So suddenly the, the idea of that has kind of changed, I think. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention about the uh, North 23rd Street site, and it just seems to rarely come up, and that is that uh, the report by the Emberg Anderson uh, Corporation company and they're quoted as saying that there is still considerable evidence that the area surrounding the detention pond on the site shows considerable contamination, primarily from petroleum-based products and residues. Now, I know we've had a number of studies, and if I was looking at, like, say, three studies, and I saw two studies that said the land was good, and I saw one study that said the land was bad, I wouldn't look at the two good studies and say, everything's okay. I'd look at the bad one and go, why is it different? 
Okay, and we have to ask ourselves, why is that one different? We have to clarify why the M. Berganison report states that. Don't ignore it. And when it comes to the uh, final price for the Vandevart site, I was looking at the, the list as everybody else was today, and I understand that the Vandevart list wasn't calibrated for today's costs and our new evaluation of the size of the police station we want. But just a quick list of the things that have to take a look at. Uh, the Vandevart site was statistically listed as higher portions and dollars in these categories. Civil engineering, landscape design, water quality assistance, sanitary sewer uh, ass assessment, gas service uh, connection, uh, electrical connection, primary service, telephone switch, data wiring, telephone devices, fiber optics, um, interior maintenance, irrigation, legal attorney fees, cable TV hookup, uh, telecom and data systems, video arrangements. These are all things that, for some reason, Vanderbilt was more expensive than 23rd. In addition, photocopying window blinds. Window blinds had zero at 23rd, and yet, for some reason, it cost money at, at Vandevart. New office furniture, old and new. Again, more at Vandevart. Why? Projection screen, walk-in cooler, all these things should not matter when it comes to when it's evaluated. All these prices should be identical for both sites. Why are they different? Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other discussion on that document? Alderman Verhassel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can I ask someone from the Building Use Committee, is the retention pond that's been talked about with contamination, is that part of the parcel we're interested in? I was going to ask Mr. Holden if there was a, a retention pond out there. <laughs> there is one now. I believe there's some petroleum impacted soils near the salt shed. Uh, and I don't know what the extent of it is or what, and I don't have any feel for an estimate uh, how to, to uh, remediate it. But you did soil boring. We, we, did, we did four test pits and found that it was filled. We dug down to the topsoil and we found just a few areas of brick asphalt, concrete, but no rubbish or anything like we had found at the retention pond. That was just plain garbage in there. And where was that retention pond? It's way, it's way on the east side of the property. It's, it's on the county property, would be part, it's not part of that 3.6 acre parcel or 3.9 acre parcel. But, but that's not to say, it's not to say that there couldn't be still, I don't think that all the, all the garbage was removed. There may be some on the east end of the proposed parcel. The, the, the problem that or the problem area that's talked about in the Engberg Moyer report is technically not on the parcel we're interested in. I you said there stands the possibility that it could be nearby. Sure, there's a possibility that there could be some on the on the east end of that property. Okay. I don't believe we found the that I recall found the western limit of it. Okay. Alderman Hanna. Yes, I just had a question. I know on the Vandervart property, I think Alderman. Ryan mentioned that a phase one environmental study had been completed. Has that also been completed on the North 23rd Street? I believe there's a phase one on North 23rd Street. Yep. Yeah, from my understanding, there was a phase one. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. <clears throat> RO number 107 by the city clerk submitted a communication from Dimple Adams stating her frustrations regarding the possible sites for the police station and the fact that North 23rd Street location is back on the table. Alderman Graff. I would move that the RO will be accepted and placed on file. Second. Motion a second to place the document on file. Any discussion? Um, Gina Steiner, would you like to take the podium. Dimple had a funeral tonight, so she couldn't make it. But um, basically, like Jeff had said, and like a lot of us had said, you know, the, the North 23rd Street site has been debated last year over and over. Lots and lots of people came forward, emailed the mayor, gave letters to the press, gave letters to everybody in the council, and this site was discussed by the Building Use Committee 
couple years back, there was a completely different building use committee. I was called by one of those members of the building use committee just yesterday, and he said that on both sides of the salt shed, it used to be a swamp. If none of you have done any kind of, um, you know, investigating and talking to these old members of the building use committee, I don't think you're looking into this as thoroughly as you say you are. And I think that the North 23rd Street site might have contamination, might not have contamination. That needs to be looked into. Whether you say, oh, well, maybe it's not in this section, you don't know that for sure. And you can't just say, well, it may not be there, so we're not going to worry about it. That's an extra cost to us taxpayers, and we'd prefer that you not spend our money unwisely. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Triple aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Our number 106-06-07 by the city clerk submitting a communication from Gail Matner asking that the Common Council vote to bring the location of the police department to a referendum. Alderman Rackey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I make a motion that the document be accepted and placed on file. Second. Motion a second to place the document on file. Is there any discussion on that document? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Triple aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Item number 11, RC number 5400506 by finance for recommending referral of resolution number 2700506 by Elder Person Graf authorizing the purchasing agent to enter into contract for police facility and city hall architectural services to the Committee of the Whole of the New Council. Alderman Graf. Mr. Chairman, um, there's still a lot of discussion that's needed on this, but I think we can do that in, in Council, or at least keep it in Council, rather than keep it in the Committee of the Whole, because this is, part of this is for the um, engineering fees for the police facility, which right now I believe are, um, are at, um, a much lower amount than than what this document has. I, I think I, I want to say it's. If Rich is still here, he would be able to tell me what. Oh yeah, what's the exi what do we have approved right now for the architectural? Mr. Gebhardt, if you could come up to the podium, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, currently, we have uh, 494,586 that's designated for the Zimmerman contract. If there's any other questions? Vice President Serta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just clarification on this. This just basically allows us to pay for services that have been rendered. It doesn't necessarily tie us specifically to City Hall. Um, I'll ask you to improve the whole document. I would guess we would be the project cost estimate and the construction cost estimate, but those are subject to change, you know. So, but we, we've got to get it out of this committee and vote on it so that we can prepare our budget, which is starting very soon. We have to make some type of recommendation. We can send it from this committee without a recommendation, but then council needs to act on it. Alderman Susha. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a couple of questions for Rich. Um, how much so far have we paid the Zimmerman Design Group? I don't have those numbers documented in front of me, but uh, I recollect I, there was part of the site study. There was an extra site study um, for 22500 I believe uh, there were payments about 40-some 40, 40 thousand, maybe about 43000 uh, previously made, and I believe we have uh, invoice in process for around thirty-five, thirty-six thousand. Okay, thank you. So it's roughly a hundred thousand dollars worth of work so far. If you include yes, the okay. latest invoice, so it's pretty close to that. Okay, thank you. And then my next question is: is um, with their contract, um, are we contracting for a flat amount, or is there a percentage based on what we build?
might need uh, John Savanash to help me address that, but on how it's structured. But uh, I, I know it's uh, various components in there that it's based on on the, you know the level of construction, and I believe in some elements in there that it is a percentage of construction. Um, but I don't know if you want. So what you're John saying is the more money we spend on the police station, the more money he's going to make. Uh, th that's normal for any uh, one mm -hmm. that's in design, any architect okay. or engineer uh, that's going to design. The larger the project, the larger the fees. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, if you've got to design a bigger building um, or oversee the construction of a larger building, it, it's going to be more costly. It's not only Zimmerman's, but obviously, you know, they have to subcontract a lot of the technical areas also. Um, so there's the various factors in there. Okay, thank you. Alderman Montemarro. Thank you, Chairman Vanderweel. I would like to make a motion to move this RC to council with no recommendation. We may end up dividing the sites if it goes to 23rd or Vandervaart. And there's been some chatter about moving a bit more slowly on the city hall renovation, depending upon lots of things. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion on the motion? Did you? No, that, that's what I was going to make. It. Same motion, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, because I know there is still some debate and discussion as far as what the project cost estimate is going to be and the construction cost and the architectural fee total, and as well as if we're doing the police facility and city hall together. All right, thank you. Any other discussion on the motion? All in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. Aye. Chair votes aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Motion second adjourn. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. We're adjourned.